Um, bonjour, Misha K. Canoon Edition Cause, Mekanak Dodame, uh, Sharon Stevenson. I'm the trust manager for the Pegasus Surrender Claim Trust. We're a community fund trust in Pegasus First Nation. Uh, currently, we're sitting at $135 million in the trust, which is a result of the illegal surrender of our initial reserve, St. Peter's, by Selkirk, Manitoba, and the move from St. Peter's to, to our current day Pegasus, which is about 200 kilometer move north into the, uh, into the swamplands. Uh, as a result of the loss of the lands, the loss of the economy, loss of our culture, uh, we were compensated with $126 million. And from that, what we've been able to do is uh, take a look at why the trust is there, what does the trust want to do, what does the community want to do. And it's a community fund trust, so it's grants, grants that uh, the community can apply for. And one of the components is uh, youth, education, cultural, language. Those are some, some of the areas. And um, as trust manager for the last three years, what I've been doing is going around to the community and to, uh, to the members, to the membership, be it in Winnipeg, Selkirk, Peguis, and um, providing them with information on what the, claim, what the surrender claim trust is about, who we are, why we have it. But what we found is we have to start talking about our history, who we are as Anishinaabe people. Where is St. Peter's? Um, as we talk to students in the high school, talk to students at the universities, they, uh, they don't realize or weren't taught our history. And that wasn't in the, in the school system. So we want to share that with them about uh, the, their uh, vast uh, cultural history, their heritage, where they came from, what it's all about, so that we have a better understanding and they have a better understanding about who they are, where did they come from, what is their sense of identity. And uh, creating that sense of identity, we find, gives them the uh, self-esteem, gives them the confidence, gives them the uh, foundation to go farther, to do more, because they have that strong base on, in terms of who they are and, and where they've come from. So we provide that type of information to them. And at the same time, we also provide opportunities. We do community grants. So students come in, youth come in, community members come in, band departments come in, apply for grants for projects, programming, infrastructure, depending on what they want to do. And we support them. So what we see there is we see a lot of people coming in, getting these grants, and we, we build resources from that so we can see who's doing what in the community. And we can share that with other community members, with uh, visitors, with uh, people that want that information. If they want to find out you know, who's a good, uh, who's a good uh, artist that can bead, that can paint, who's uh, doing what programming in the community. So from that, we find out who's doing what. And so we're, we're a source of resources for, for the community and for other people too. And uh, what we've been also doing is comprehensive community planning. With the $126 million that the surrender claim received from the federal government, we also received $65 million in treaty land entitlement trust monies too. So with almost $200 million coming into the community, the trustees needed to know what the community plans were. So we have $200 million, what are we gonna do with it? What's the plans, what's our vision? Where are we going? How are we gonna get there? And who's gonna, who's gonna prepare us to get there? So we have to make sure we inform the community members, um, educate, share, but also get their knowledge. Because as we talk to different uh, community members, we're finding their skills, their gifts, we're finding their ideas. And uh, so we want, we want other people to be aware of that too, so that we know kind of where we're going, where we're heading. And that'll give uh, the, the, governing, the government uh, a sense of uh, a path, a path that they can, uh, they, can, they can take us down, that we can walk together, that we can get where we're going based on the community's decisions. Um, and you know, from that we see it, it'll be, it's, a, it's not an easy path, but it's a path that we've determined together, that we know where we want to go. So we can see the vision and we want to get there. So that's what we're also working on too. We're trying to get that uh, community engagement going. We're trying to get the resources together. We're trying to get the community talking about where they want to be. Um, we do some sessions, information sessions about who we are, where we came from, what what we're currently doing and why we're here. But also we talk about the future, about where we're going. Where do they want to be? 
um, what careers are available within the community, within the trust industry, within the investment industry, within the community as a whole, whether it be Winnipeg, Pegwis, Selkirk, wherever Pegwis has lands and wherever Pegwis members are. So that's one of the uh, kind of one of the big things that we try to do. At the same time, too, we try to um, do some financial literacy in terms of who wants to be a millionaire. So as community members, we let them know that um, they're millionaires. They have $135 million in uh, surrender trust money currently, and they have $50 million in TLE monies. So what are they going to do with it? It's your responsibility. It's your money. You have to know how to handle it. You have to know how to manage it, and you have to know what you're going to do with it. So we do a session on that, so it makes them aware of uh, what they need to be, of what they should be aware of as millionaires, and what they could be doing with the money, and hopefully give them some ideas in terms of, well, maybe you know, I'll start applying to the trust, or I'll become a trustee, or I'll become a trust manager. Or I'll go to university college and I'll pursue this and then come back and I can do some work for the community. So we're trying to inspire and motivate with, uh, with the information we have, but also with the uh, funding that's available through the trust and the, the management of the monies that we have here. What we started doing is we started doing community engagement sessions at the community hall with the community as a whole. And... Um, to bring the community members in, we had to find ways to uh, to motivate them, to inspire them to come. So we started doing, uh, we do lunch, we do door prizes, but we also do speakers and we invite community members in to speak on uh, areas, uh, areas of interest that they have. That way they bring themselves, they bring their families, they bring their coworkers in, and we start getting a lot more people involved. But we also start uh, using local resources. So we started looking within. So one of the mo one of the mottos we have is community strength comes from within. So we started looking within the community because we have about 12,000 members in Pegwis. And uh, so there must be someone that can do what needs to be done or has those resources or the skills. So we started doing that. And as we, as we continued with those sessions, we started realizing that we have to change the way things are going. We have to... Uh, inspire change, but the best way probably would be to go through the youth, go through the students. We, let's uh, let's start with them. So we started with their history, uh, letting them know who they are. We started bringing in elders, talking about the teachings, about the way things were, about we had we had our own uh, uh, systems in place. And uh, we have to acknowledge those, we have to honor them, and we have to recognize them. So we started doing that, and then we started talking to the students about um, what they can do, about the power that they have, the opportunities that they have, the things that they can do. And one of the things we did with the grade 12 students specifically, and related to the trusts, was we started taking them to um, national conferences. We have the A4A Canada National Conference. We have the National Aboriginal Trust Officers Conference. And these were conferences where they can see what opportunities are out there. They can see a bigger world outside of Pegwis. They can meet a lot more people out there and start to get to know what other opportunities are there. They can meet vice presidents, presidents of investment management firms. They can meet um, heads of banking, banking companies. They can meet so many people, in, including other uh, First Nations, other communities, and finding out what's going on there, that we have a lot of similarities in place, and that these people are just another person. So they're just like you. There's, uh, they're no different. And uh, so we wanted to open up their eyes to the world and let them see what's out there. Um, but we also wanted to engage them. We didn't just want to send them to the conference, go to these sessions. We had to um, motivate them. So we gave them something like a scavenger hunt, questions to ask, people to pursue, uh, people to take pictures of. One of the examples is uh, they went to A4E Canada National Conference in Halifax. We took, uh, took the group there. Uh, for their scavenger hunt, they had to find Terry Goodtrack and take a selfie with him. But first they had to find out who, figure out who Terry Goodtrack was and then to figure out what he looked like. And then I forgot to tell Terry that the kids were coming. <laughs> so I saw him and he says, you know, all these kids from Pegasus are coming up to me and they they want a selfie with me. It makes me feel so important. <laughs> so it was, it was fun. It was, it was cute. We also had them work with uh, one of the trade uh, at a trade booth. So we arranged for some of the trade booths to uh, take them in for an, for half an hour to an hour, show them how to engage, show, show them how to uh, market the uh, the resources that were there, show them how to uh, 
to uh, make people feel comfortable, invite them in. And uh, hopefully that would uh, kind of make them feel confident about themselves and uh, make them feel good. So those were, those were some of the things. They also had to talk to uh, people from different areas and um, uh, provide them with a small gift, a pin from Pegwis, you know, to say thank you. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, introduce themselves, and uh, hope they'll see them again. So those types of things we wanted them to be actively engaged in so that they weren't sitting in the workshops, sitting in the conference, but they were out there doing something and also getting involved in all of the activities that are there. So uh, it kept them busy and it, uh, it was nice to hear some of the feedback from the, uh, from the delegates and from the organizers that they enjoyed having the students there and they enjoyed seeing them, seeing them involved. So uh, I think that was probably one of the uh, one of the uh, things that um, initiated the youth the youth concept with A4A Canada to have them more more involved in and invite the youth. But with A4A Canada, we also have the uh, the youth award winners. The it was MNP youth award. Uh, we had uh, we try to get Pegu students to apply as they can. So we did happen to have one of them that was um, was awarded. Uh, was recognized one year. So they took him to the conference, they took him on a tour. Uh, his comments were, he met so many people there, so many institutions, um, banks, financial institutions, uh, some of the universities, colleges were asking him to apply, apply to their uh, programs. So it was nice to see and it made him feel good that people were interested in him, but also that uh, he wasn't aware of what was there. So it was nice to meet all those people. He met the Lieutenant Governor, he met a few of the chiefs there, so he he had a good time. So it was not it's it was a good experience for him to take back to the community and let other people know that they too can apply, uh, get try and get the awards and take this opportunity to get to know a whole bunch of people. So uh, and it's a big world out there. Yeah, as much as Pegasus is the center of my universe, you know it's it's nice to be out there too. One of um, one of the things I found growing up in growing up in Pegasus is my parents were uh, my dad was a pulp cutter, seasonal labor. My mother was a janitor at the hospital. They instilled in us that you had to get an education. We don't want you working in the in the bush with us. We don't want you working in as a janitor. We want you to get a good education so you can become independent. You can be comfortable. You can have your own life. That was okay. That was great. Um, but at the same time, they didn't teach us anything about who we are in terms of our identity as Anishinaabe people. They didn't teach us the language. They, uh, they, we were told to go to church, um, Anglican church. We didn't have any cultural teachings. We did have stories, but it was, uh, it was stories that, uh, they were, that had been passed on from them, but it wasn't, uh, promoted that it was, uh, part of our culture that was being taught. It was um, more of warnings, you know, don't wander out off late at night, uh, stay away from the rivers type of thing. These, these spirits will get you. So that's how, that's how I grew up is go to school. Uh, we go to school or go to work. Those are your two options. Um, so it wasn't until I got to university that I started realizing that as an indigenous person, I have a history, I have a culture, I have a whole bunch of um, ancestors behind me and what they did. That wasn't shared with us until until we got until we got to college or university, and then from there, that's when we started finding out that you know there was a way of life. There was we didn't have these schools, we didn't have these textbooks, we didn't have this type of teaching. There was a whole different way of uh, of learning, a whole different way of uh, teachings that were that were there before, and including the language. So that was that was an eye opener. But at the same time, too, I find that uh, Pegasus is really colonized, and part of it was the transfer from from the St. Peter's area to Pegasus. It was push the schools, push push the churches, uh, no language taught, no no culture taught, no dancing taught, no ceremonies. So these were all pushed pushed down. They were all buried. And it wasn't until later that people start realizing that, you know, hey, we, you know, we had a way of life that was, that's good and that's still there, but it's buried. And uh, so it started, started making its appearance. So I thought that I was book smart. I could go, I could, you know, get it, get a couple of degrees and uh, graduate, graduate high school, graduate university. 
And, you know, this would I'd be great. But what I didn't realize until later that I didn't know anything about who I was as an Indigenous person. I didn't know my culture, didn't know my culture, didn't know my language, uh, took the classes. But again, it's the academic classes. You still have to live the life. You still have to uh, participate in it. So what I was able to do later on was start was try and find out more about it. So I'd be sitting down with uh, some of the cultural innovators, the ones that were starting to push the culture, starting to realize that you know we had we have all these all these ceremonies, we have all these uh, things that we should do the these this way of life that's starting to make a comeback. And by starting to um, spend more time with them, including the hunters and gatherers group in Peguis. Uh, they would take young young men and teach them hunter safety, firearms acquisition, uh, how to look after um, how to winter survival, summer survival, how to look after equipment so that they'd be able to look after themselves, teach them about trapping, teach them about how to uh, take care of animals, how to um, harvest animals, plants. It was from there that uh, I started realizing that uh, our ancestors were really smart. They they knew the land, they knew the animals, they knew the trees, they knew the plants, and that what um, I guess what we've been doing is taking taking that knowledge but accrediting it to someone else and not giving them the recognition that they they should receive that we did have a have a wonderful a wonderful way of life, and we knew our ancestors knew a lot. So realizing that. That was great, but at the same time too, when I look at the treaties, when I look at the um, the the work that they did with the uh, with another nation, it's like you know they were really they were really smart. They really thought ahead. So when you talk about going seven generations ahead, going towards for for those yet unborn, I start to see it. I've been starting to see it now. So I take a look at uh, the Sulker uh, Treaty. I take a look at Treaty Number One. I take a look at you know some of the treaties and the thinking, the thinking that's there that went behind it and the uh, the forethought. So when I was working in Indian Affairs, the um, some of the staff there were, well, this contract should be over, it should be finished. You know, we've paid enough. But it's no, it regardless if you've paid enough, that's not what was assigned. It was it was supposed to be until un, until uh, the water stopped flowing. And I guess at that time the uh, probably the European nation never realized that it was going to be forever or hopefully forever. Uh, so those types of things, those types of thoughts are starting to are starting to make me realize that there was a lot of planning, a lot of thinking that went into uh, into negotiations from our from our ancestors and our and our elders. It wasn't um, they, it wasn't kind of imposed on them. They had their input. Um, but at the same time too, we have to acknowledge uh, the teachings there. The, uh, the way they did things. And we're starting to see it now too. We have a really strong land, land-based land education system in Pegasus, and we're seeing it in other First Nations and other communities too, that it's not all classroom-based education anymore. We have to get the students, we have to get the children out onto the land, out working with the community members. We have to bring the elders in. We have to bring those people with their gifts in because we have to find what those gifts are within these children. And so they can honor them, recognize them, but also acknowledge the gifts that they have because it's important to know what your purpose is, who you are, and uh, what, you're, what you're good at. You're, you're here for a reason. Um, one of the things we find is um, with the spirit names. When someone gets their spirit names, it's, it's a, there's a reason behind they have, why they have that name, and uh, there's a meaning to it. And that, uh, that seems to ground them. It gives them a good sense of who they are and why they're that way. But uh, it also gives them the opportunity to, to, to give them a strong sense of identity. And then from that, uh, there it helps. It helps on their their path. But uh, for the education part, we have to we have to involve the students in more than just um, classroom based education. They have to get out there. They have to be involved and they have to participate. But they we also have to recognize that there's different different ways of learning. We can as we sit with the elders, when we ask them questions. We can't ask pointed questions. It's hard to talk and give them a straight answer. So it's nice to sit there and listen to them, listen to their stories, and then we, it starts to come out and they start telling us more than we actually wanted to, to know at the time, to learn. 
we start uh, finding out more. So it's we need that opportunity to sit with people and just to just have them share their their experiences. But not just the elders too that we're we're finding as we're talking talking to the students, talking to the children, and listening to them. That uh, we have to get at get down to their level and work with them at that level so that we can listen to them. And uh, I have to sit back every once in a while and trying not to tell them what I want them to do or what I expect from them. I want them to tell me what they want. And that's part of our community engagement too, is talking to them or listening to them about what they want to do and how can we help them do what they want to do, not what we think they should be doing. So it's um, it's been a, it's been a good eye opener, but it's also been uh, it's been refreshing, I think, to to see that uh, there is a lot of mo motivation. There's a lot of um, vision there, but we just have to we just have to bring it out. We ha just have to give them that opportunity to share that. As I look forward for the next 10, 10, 15 years into the near future. What I'm currently seeing right now is that uh, sense of acknowledgement, um, appreciation for who we are as Anishinaabe people. Some see it, some don't, because we still have that colonial attitude where it's, uh, you know, it's it's not uh, it's not appreciated, it's not understood, and it's something that we haven't been doing for a long time. There's still that battle between Christianity and the traditional uh, traditionalists in the com in the community. At the same time, we do have a lot of the traditionalists who are maybe pursuing ceremonies, but it's uh, we're not exactly sure if it's let's say the Anishinaabe ceremony or a Sioux ceremony or a ceremony they may have adopted from somewhere else. It's starting to get a little a little mixed. So we have we have to well, because we don't have to, but we need to look at um, what we're doing and who we are, understanding who we are and where we're coming from, so that we don't start bringing in too many different things and um, mudding. I guess mudding the water, changing things. Uh, um, but being, I guess, being on the same page. But there is a lot of there is a lot of that coming. There's a lot of that starting, and people are starting to go back to the old ways. They're starting to go back to the ceremonies, and they're looking for a sense of meaning from from that. We're seeing a, a resurgence in the language. We're starting to see people starting to um, get their spirit names. Being one of the main things is going to the medicine people and. Uh, and seeking the healing, but also seeking the identity, uh, trying to figure out who they are, why are they here, and um, giving them sen a, a good sense of identity so they can move forward from that. It's also, a, it, it's also a, I guess, an appreciation of who they are, but what I see is, uh, I see pride. I see some pride in those that, as they speak in the community, they start to recognize uh, um, they introduce themselves by their spirit names, and then they start talking in the, in the English language. We do have some elders now that can come to the community meetings and can speak in Ojibwe and um, do the prayers, do a presentation, just to show the community that it's possible. They didn't have it before, they weren't taught before, but they've learned the language and they've been able to share it now, and they're taking pride in that. We're starting to see a lot of, uh, a lot of children with um, Ojibwe Ojibwe or uh, some some uh, some traditional name now, so that's starting to get into the system now, so that it's not um, biblical names anymore. Or, um, so we're starting to see a lot of that, a lot of that happening. So it's it's nice it's nice to see where that we're starting to do that. Some of the changes yet is uh, we still have to change our government our governance system. We're still Indian Indian affair Indian Act based elected chief and council for two years, doesn't give them much time to, uh, to, to uh, lead the community for those two years. It uh, doesn't give us much time to grow and develop because of the, uh, the lack of consistency in governance. So we do need to change that, but at the same time, we shouldn't be relying only on chief and council to, to govern the community. It has to be the community leaders, it has to be the departments, they should, um, administrative departments, they need to start taking uh, the responsibility, but also the leadership to show the community about where, where they want to go, what they want to do. And uh, govern, the chief of council can support them. They can uh, be, they can walk with them, but they don't have to be the, uh, the ones telling them 
what to do, where to go, and how to do it. Um, the community needs to do that. The community needs to step up and be involved in that area. We uh, we started recognizing our community leaders in uh, in Peguis, and these are people that are doing great things without um, without the appointment, without the um, without receiving any kind of a payment for the work that they do. But because they want to do it, they want, they're doing it for the community, they're doing it for their family, they're doing it because uh, they have the skills, they have the gifts for it. And it's nice to see those people being recognized and honored for, for what they've done. So we need to do more of that. We have to start acknowledging who we have in the community and the skills and the gifts that they have. Um, at the same time, we know that um, Chief and Council do still still do need some recognition because we do rely on them there um, we have to we have to um, rely on them to support us to uh, provide the advice to uh, to to um, I guess take the next step with the government with the uh, usually with the federal government provincial government there yeah. but we do need our community leaders to uh, to be to be involved we also need to make sure that uh, communication is open among the community People need to know what's going on. We have social media, but we need to know from the government governance side and from the administrative side what's happening in the community. It builds trust the more you know about what's going on. It gives you a better sense of what the community is doing, how they're developing, how they're advancing, with uh, and who's doing what. So when you hear good things about people, uh, acknowledge it, record it. Put it out there so that we can take pride in what's happening. It doesn't have to be the provincial, the federal awards. It could be something good that's happening where, uh, uh, where it makes you feel good, and we start building on that, on that, um, on the pride. And also, it's nice to acknowledge it too. As a person, if you receive something and someone mentioning mentions it, it makes you feel good about what you've done, and it's also a conf confirmation of uh, of the good that you're doing. So hopefully motivate the person to continue doing what they're doing. Those, uh, those are some of the things that I'd like to see uh, within the community. We do need that comprehensive community plan to continue where the community and community lets us know what they want to do and we come together in the different areas to figure out where we're going and then how we're going to get there so that we can start those discussions and continue those discussions, but yet still involve uh, all the community members, be it on reserve, off reserve, and the different groups there. So we need ever we need input from everyone so that uh, we know what uh, where we're going.